The world is in the grip of several problems simultaneously attacking both the global economy and the financial markets. We have the European gas crisis. We have a Fed that has very overtly said it has to be hawkish in the near term. And therefore, the world financial markets have to negotiate both inflation and recession fears. Today in Global Dialogues, we have someone who is best placed to tell us how the global economy may negotiate these uh, contradictory forces. We have with us Jose Vinels. He is the chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, but a very interesting uh, set of credentials. Uh, uh, he was graduated from London School of Economics and then a doctoral degree from Harvard, a professor of economics at Stanford, and then served as a deputy governor of the Bank of Spain. And uh, I am a financial counselor at a very interesting period, 2009 to 2016, and now, of course, chairman at Standard Chartered Bank. Mr. Vinels, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Well, first up, since you are coming from Europe and from the UK, uh, if you can tell us uh, whether the gas crisis is going to, uh, you know, roil Europe for some time, do you see th these as creating inflationary problems or recessionary problems? Well, thank you very much, and it's really, it's really great to be uh, again talking to you. Yes, Europe is in a in a difficult situation as a result of the um, Russia-Ukraine crisis and the implications that have followed for uh, gas prices um, as a result of the reduction in the supply of Russian gas to, to, to Europe and to the United Kingdom as well. And this creates both things. It creates um, inflation because it increases energy prices and because energy is also an important input into so many other uh, products and services, this is something that leads to uh, a, a, a higher mm -hmm. uh, cost of living and a cost of living squeeze. So this is something which reduces the purchasing power of households. Uh, there are also higher production costs for firms, and this is something which reduces profitability and squeezes investment. So as a result, you have inflation, and then you have a reduction in the pace of aggregate demand, and this is pushing Europe uh, also into uh, very lower growth and, and possibly into a recession in the European Union in the uh, in the later part of the year. Well, something uh, perhaps less severe but similar is playing out in the United States. Uh, what's your estimate uh, that uh, we should expect from the Fed? Should we expect uh, hikes to continue even beyond 4% Fed funds rate? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to say because it will depend very much on the pace of inflation reduction. What we know, especially uh, after uh, Jackson Hole and with the uh, very strong statements for, uh, from Chairman Jay Powell, is that the Fed is going to continue uh, in a very determined way to fight inflation. And the latest reading we have from, you know, uh, CPI in the United States is 8.5 percent. This is a slight moderation. So it seems like the policy of higher interest rates is uh, already contributing to some inflation moderation. But this is something that will continue. My expectation would be that between now and the end of the years uh, of the year, interest rates uh, by the Fed would be taken close to 4 percent. And contrary to what market expect, I don't think that they will go beyond 4 percent or be cut next year. I think it's more likely that interest rates come close to 4 percent this year and then remain uh, in that sort of plateau for the rest of the year. And then if inflation keeps coming down, then we'll see. But I don't see a scenario where interest rates in the United States will be cut uh, early next year or even later in the year. That seemed to be the fine print both at Jackson Hole and in the previous FOMC minutes. Yes. But, uh, uh, you know, how do you expect uh, inflation to play out for the rest of the decade? There are people like El Arian and, uh, uh, you know, I think even Barry Eichengreen spoke to us on Global Dialogues. His expectation is that inflation may fall off from 85 but it may not come to the Fed's 2% uh, mark for a very long time. Uh, would, would you say that may be the scenario? Well, I think that this is certainly a possibility. My central scenario is that the Fed takes so 
uh, uh, you know, is so strongly determined to bring down inflation that they would do whatever is necessary to bring inflation to the average of 2%. And this is something that I think would be uh, closer than inflation remaining at 4%, because that would not be consistent with the Fed mandate. Now, I think the key question uh, would be if the Fed stick to its can, so bringing down inflation to 2%, um, what is going to be the implications for the real economy in the United States? And already what we're seeing in the United States is that the economy has had a technical recession in the second quarter. And I think that we're very likely to go to a real recession in terms of two quarters of negative growth in the last quarter of uh, uh, you know, this year and the first quarter of next year. So that doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to have for a full year, let's say next year, negative growth, but it's going to be close to that with parts of the year being in negative territory. So again, the implication is going to be some pain for the economic uh, growth in the United States, bringing it below zero for a couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, is going to be a price that the Fed is willing to take mm -hmm. in order to fulfill its mandate. Mm -hmm. And if the Fed were unable to do that, I would be really worried, because that would erode the credibility of the yes. Fed in fighting inflation, and the costs in terms of uh, the economy would be much higher over the longer term. So I think that central banks have this trade-off between short-term pain yeah. and then maintaining their credibility and avoiding costs over the medium term, which would be larger. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have seen the GFC and you were uh, at the helm of IMF uh, post the global financial crisis. What's your sense in terms of the impact of a 4 percent, consistently high 4 percent Fed funds rate for probably the next eight quarters? Uh, can there be, you know, uh, nations or even large uh, corporate or financial entities that may default? Well, we have already seen um, some problems in some countries like, like Sri Lanka. And um, that certainly, uh, you know, that certainly already happened. Now, of course, when you have higher interest rates in the United States, which can accompany it with a, uh, by a strong dollar, this is something that puts pressure on emerging markets and developing economies, especially those who are highly indebted and those who are highly indebted in dollars. And there are some African countries which may be going through some pressures. But again, I think that we need to understand that the impact on uh, emerging markets and developing economies is going to depend very much on the strength of their domestic fundamentals. And if the economic fundamentals are solid, if uh, these are countries which have, you know, significant foreign exchange reserves, which have reasonable policies, I think that markets are going to regard those countries in a much more favorable light, and therefore these countries are not going to be in trouble. While those countries which have, you know, inappropriate economic policies, where they are, you know, they have very little foreign exchange reserves, where they are not doing the right things in terms of fundamentals, and they have very significant mm -hmm. external debt, which may become unsustainable, markets will be uh, sort of uh, uh, moving against those uh, markets, and there will be issues. You know, we've seen uh, the stock markets reflect that already. Uh, year to date, or even month to date, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nifty, the Indian uh, uh, Nifty and Sensex, the stock indexes, have dramatically outperformed uh, American indexes, exactly. uh, Wall Street indexes. Uh, you know, we celebrated this even in 2008 for a period, or even 2009, and we called it decoupling. Asia's macros are better. I mean, even Indonesia, to some extent, perhaps even Korea. The, uh, you know, the inflation is not that bad, and growth is not that much under pressure, at least in countries like India and Indonesia. You think Asia can definitely outperform over the next few quarters? I, I think so. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the West is suffering a lot more and Asia is in a much better position. Now, one should not underestimate the fact that the West is, is very much linked to Asia, and the West is a significant source of Asian, you know, of, 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 demand. Of, of demand for Asian exports. But having said that, if you look at Asia, India is a case in point, is an economy which is doing 
extremely well. The growth prospects for uh, India, both uh, this fiscal year, 23 and uh, 24 fiscal year, are, are very good with some moderation of growth next year. But still, you know, such a large emerging market with such high growth rates. This is something which is very hard to find in the world. And I think that this is something that bodes well for, for Asia. China also, they're having a, a, a you know a slowdown in growth this year. The expectation is that as they start reopening from, from COVID and with the policy support in place, they would be able to go to higher growth rates, uh, you know, uh, next year and so on. And we see also that the ASEAN economies are doing overall quite well. So I think that, I, I, you know, Asia is in a much better place and there is some asymmetry, I wouldn't speak of the coupling, but some asymmetry between the fortunes of Europe and the United States and the UK uh, compared to Asian countries at least for 22 and 23. Okay, so not decoupling, but uh, asymmetry in their macros. We need to scratch that point further. A quick break and we are back with more questions to Dr. Jose Vinales. Thank you very much for staying with us on Global Dialogues. I've been speaking with Jose Vinales, Chairman of Standard Chartered Bank Group, and of course, uh, an extremely well-known economist, both at the IMF, at the Bank of Spain, and uh, uh, for his knowledge of uh, global economics. Well, uh, Dr. Vinels, thank you very much for your patience. Well, uh, you know, how would you s uh, look at uh, smart money moving? Do you think smart money or funds, big funds, will be willing to come to Asia, Asian countries like India or Indonesia, uh, despite, you know, there being a risk off in global markets, in uh, developed markets? Well, I think so, and we're already seeing this after uh, you know, our first uh, half of the year where we had significant uh, outflows in terms of portfolio funds from, from India, we have had uh, six billion of inflows yes. in the month of August. And that is something which reflects very well on uh, the uh, understanding that investors have about the future uh, prospects of India. As I was saying one moment ago, uh, Indian growth prospects are uh, excellent, you know, 7%, I think 7% or around that this fiscal year, and for 24 fiscal years, some moderation to 5.5% or so. And uh, what we're seeing is that the actions that have been uh, put in place by the government over the last few years in order to increase the ease of doing business, in order to improve infrastructures, in order to, you know, the bankruptcy law, the clean up of the banking system, all of those things have contributed together with the significant sort of improvement of infrastructures. All of those reforms have contributed to reinforce the confidence of international and domestic investors and the incentives that have uh, been applied in India to bring in sort of investment to strengthen manufacturing, I think, are very, very potent. So all in all, I see that, uh, you know, international money will continue to look very favorably to India and other Asian markets like the one you mentioned. Okay. Uh, but I, I do want your thoughts on how global trade and uh, global economy itself will evolve. I don't know if you saw the recent paper by the Credit Suisse strategist uh, Zoltan Pozar. He very strongly argues that uh, from 1990 up until perhaps, uh, you know, 2015, we had a period when the great powers trusted each other. And therefore, you know, there was distribution of uh, production manufacturing centers. We saw inflation coming down. But now there is distrust. It is French shoring or, you know, near shoring or on shoring of manufacturing. Uh, when there is so much distrust, the cost of manufacturing, he argues, is bound to go up because you're not seeking out the cheapest destinations. So he's arguing for a decade of inflation. Is that sounding convincing? Well, I think, I think this is a, a very complicated problem, and I think it goes... Um, beyond that in some directions. I'll try to explain that very, yeah. you know, uh, very briefly. The first has to do with uh, globalization, the fate of globalization. 
And while I don't think that we're going to go in a deglobalization mode, I think that there are some uh, sort of risks regarding fragmentation, some of which have already materialized, for example, in the technology space. So I think that that is going to create an environment which is different from the one we had in previous decades, which contributed to uh, uh, disinflationary forces and to growth forces in the global economy. So I think that in so far as there is some fragmentation, uh, there is going to be uh, more sort of an inflationary bias and, 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 and a negative uh, growth bias. So that's number one. Second, we have demographics. And there is the aging of, uh, of populations in many important parts of the world, certainly in the West, certainly in, in, in important parts of Asia. That is going to lead to uh, effects which may go both ways. As there is less supply of uh, working age uh, population, this is likely to lead to higher wages. On the other hand, as people get older, they're likely to become more conservative and vote for more conservative monetary and fiscal policies, which tend to tame inflation. So you're going to see forces moving in, in, in both directions. And number three, I think we have the digital revolution. And that is something which is going to put some disinflationary yes, pressures hopefully. and also provide some scope for productivity growth. So I think that the picture is, is slightly mixed. But if you feel that globalization may be the most important of these forces, then you would see, you would think that the disinflationary forces that we have had over the last couple of last few decades may not be there in the future. And therefore, this is going to be a more of a challenging environment for central banks, which, you know, whose mandate is to contribute to price stability and keeping inflation low. Yes, so uh, we live in interesting times. Oh, well, I, actually, I, I didn't bring forth a very important uh, issue, climate. Uh, and now we're all into sustainable financing. The Indian government is thinking of uh, sovereign green bonds. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, will, uh, will we be able to strike a whole new area of sovereign bonds? Are they likely to be uh, having higher yields or lower yields? How do you see this entire issue of uh, uh, sustainable financing. Yeah, I think sustainable finance is extraordinarily important for the world and particularly for emerging markets and developing economies because this is where the impact of climate change is going to be felt the most yes. and this is where most investment is needed and therefore more financing. And certainly we have produced a report called Just in Time where we look at the financing needs of eight top emerging markets in the world. And we judge that emerging markets uh, would need, those emerging markets would need about um, $100 trillion of uh, financing between now, sustainable financing between now and the end of 2060 in order to meet the net zero commitments, okay? That's about the size of global GDP. But, you know, emerging markets and developing economies don't have that money on their own. Okay. So there needs to be a contribution from the private sector and there, need to be, there needs to be international capital flows moving from developed markets into emerging markets and developing economies. And Standard Chartered, as a global bank, acts as a bridge for that. And we are sitting in many places, you know, like London, like New York, like Singapore and Hong Kong, where the money is. And we need to make sure that money flows from international financial centers to the countries that need it the most. So this is incredibly important. And I think that the role that the private sector can play in financing sustainability is absolutely of the essence. Because if that happens, then emerging markets and developing economies will be able to experience both the net zero uh, you know, transition to net zero and positive uh, impact on economic growth. While if emerging and developing countries are left to themselves, they are unable to, they will be Absolutely. unable to cope with, uh, uh, you know, with both net zero and the requirements of continuing to grow and develop. But do you see so much, uh, uh, you know, realization of the need for this transfer of resources? Because, you know, it was such a felt need that created the WTO and deglobalization. But uh, now, with the first whiff of war, the green uh, goals have been pulled back because, you know, the Ukraine war created uh, energy crises in every country. So do you think the world is sufficiently committed 
to pursue green goals and sustainable yeah. finance? I think that even more than before, because the awareness now is, for example, that fighting climate change and getting energy security go hand in hand. So okay. people have seen new dimensions. And in the West, for example, in Europe in particular, the commitment towards a sustainable uh, source of energy, uh, green renewables, is become even more important. So I think that's moving the right direction. The United States, I see it's a little bit more complicated. It, it's, it's perhaps not moving so strongly, but certainly I can see that in Europe. And you know, going around our markets, I can still see tremendous determination on the part of many governments to continue with their plans for transition and to work hand in hand with the private sector, international banks like us, in order to make sure we can make that process happen. Okay. Well, I have uh, another unrelated question, but something which you, with your experience in IMF, will perhaps be better placed to uh, speak on. Uh, do you think there will be a lot of non-dollar bilateral uh, settlement of trades? Uh, you know, we are talking about uh, Singapore's pay now getting integrated with India's UPI and some transfer of payments. At least India is working towards it. This is at a very retail level. But uh, do you think for maybe digital reasons and for other reasons, it is possible that we will have bilateral settlement of trade in non-dollar uh, currencies? Probably also because, you know, uh, Russia's reserves were taken away for a whole host of reasons and the development of digital currencies. Well, I think that the development of digital currencies, and particularly of central bank digital currencies, may be a new ball game, and that may contribute to more diversification in the sort of settlement currencies. But in the traditional analog world, although I see a scope for, for some of that happening, I would think that the dollar would continue having an extraordinarily uh, large presence on those on those settlements, cross-border settlements. So these things, as we know, only change uh, at very slow pace. So you know, in terms of the international preeminence of the dollar, I think that uh, it would be there for a long time. Although I can see the world moving, especially in digital space, towards a more multipolar uh, sort of currency composition than what we're actually seeing in the analog world. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, in the near term, we exaggerate the change, but maybe in the long term, uh, it will change the way we transact. Uh, yes, uh, can't take away your eye from the dollar at the moment. The index is at 110, so really at its strongest. Well, just a final question. How confident are you of global economic growth and global trade? Uh, we saw the best years for global trade in the 90s and in the first decade of this millennium. Uh, do you think the best has passed? Well, it, it's up up to us, okay? It's up to governments and it's up to the private sector. And uh, one thing uh, which is important is that although a lot of uh, discussion uh, centers around, uh, you know, trade and the implosion of trade, etc., I will make the point that trade nowadays is still stronger than pre-pandemic. Okay, so I think that is important. And second, that yes, we're having some moderation of uh, global trade uh, growth, and the slowdown in manufacturing growth will tell us that this is going to last for you know quite a number of months still. But over the medium term, again, studies that we have made at Santa Charta suggest that global trade is likely to continue expanding over the medium term at significant uh, pace. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vinels. It was a pleasure trying to understand uh, the global economy from your point of view. So whether it is China plus one, or whether it is uh, avoiding a recession through a soft landing, or avoiding uh, the worst of climate change, the future really is in our hands. That's his message. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Global Dialogues.